Yes. Okay, and Mike Pazin, who I'm also working on this with, is here as well. Uh, so yes, we're, we've talked with some of you and we're... Okay, so this is the <coughs> concept clearance. Okay, so this is actually an extremely simple-minded uh, justification. Um, as Adam had discussed about the reason why we look at exomes or why we look at whole genome sequence, obviously there's a cost issue. But the other reason is we don't know how to interpret variation in non-coding regions, which is a serious issue. Um, but, but that's really pretty much a simple-minded justification for this whole effort. Uh, we have a whole genome. Uh, Jeff Schloss's program has been very effective at generating ways of sequencing the whole genome. Um, and as I'll say a little bit later, we know that there's lots of stuff that affects phenotype and disease in the non-coding parts of the genome. So uh, exomes are so 2010. So, so the question is, uh, we know that many genes and variants are associated with the disease. Which ones are actually causal? Um, and as you, as you know, function is complicated, causation is complicated. Um, we'll, def we'll talk a little bit about how we're going to sort of get away from the word causal. But the point is, as you, as you well know, and we've seen these things all the time, that um, you get a region of the genome, and um, some of you even know how to interpret this sort of diagram, but you get a whole bunch of variants associated with each other, with the disease. And um, there's clearly something going on there. Something of a genetic variant really is mechanistically. You have a stay to the sorry, <laughs> pathogenes pathogenically, uh, causally, mechanistically related to disease. There's something that's really there that is contributing to the mechanism of how disease happens. But they've got a whole bunch of buddies along for the ride. And it's very, I mean, LD does exist. It's very non-trivial um, to figure out, okay, here, there is a region, there's something real in there, but of a whole bunch of variants in those region, which is the variant or variants that's really, really causing the phenotypic effect? So we know about uh, the genetic code. Um, coding regions have the genetic code, so we understand much as it's, uh, there can be a lot of oversimplifications here, but it's a good place to start that you know what's synonymous, non-synonymous, and stop codon variants. So, it's, so in the coding regions, we have some good information that helps us interpret it. Um, in the exon, it's about 1.5 percent of the genome. If you only focus on the exon, exon exonic regions, it's like looking under the lamppost for your keys. Uh, we know that non-toting DNA variants affect human diseases. There's a bunch of diseases and there's many more. We know they affect uh, drug use, uh, response to drugs. Um, you know, the GWAS catalog is full of, full of uh, these associations, 90 percent or so are which are not in exons. Um, we know that both the GWAS and if you look at scans of the genome for natural selection, that a lot of these adaptation signatures outs are outside of protein coding regions. So there's a lot of the genome that clearly has functional effects that's not in exonic regions. Lots of interesting things that these sequence does. So that we're getting to the concept, interpreting variation in human non-coding genomic regions using computational approaches with experimental validation. To, so what we're trying to do, we're actually trying to address the really hardest questions here. Um, as you know, as I said, function is complicated. Um, there's sort of easier function and harder function. The easier function is things like looking for transcription factor binding sites. You know, that's not trivial. That's an encode type project where you go through the genome and you look for these elements. Um, the question is, though, which of these elements actually affect organismal function? Just as many variants probably have zero effect on function, um, it's Adam likes the metaphor of, of a perfectly functioning door that goes nowhere. It can work at the molecular level, but really not have, make a difference at the organismal level. And so figuring out which variants actually cause organismal effect is a hard problem. 
And so we thought it would be worthwhile to stimulate research in this area. Um, which is to say, we still need all those molecular studies. Those are hugely important. But we thought we would focus on the harder problem. Um, and so we're, the other thing, of course, is that um, computational approaches, there's a huge data set base that's needed here. Um, it would be great to get a lot more of these data. Um, so, but that's, <laughs> that's a separate discussion. Um, there certainly are data sets that already exist that can be used. Um, so we want to uh, do computational approaches, highly innovative, to, to identify or narrow the set of potential variants. Causality is a very hard problem. So we're not, especially we're trying to stimulate this area with the validation, the experimental validation. We're not trying to have groups absolutely prove that this variant causes that disease. Um, but we want to narrow the set of variants to ones that are potentially contain the, ca the causal variant. So I'm confused. Uh, then what do you mean by oh, experimental, experimental valid validation yes. if it's not to show that the variant causes the phenotype of interest? Well, there's show. So first off, um, we're talking about computational approaches, so computational predictions. But then we want to have some ground truth with experimental validation. Um, there's a whole range of validation from low throughput gold-plated validation that really does show that that variant causes that disease, but that's very expensive. To the extent there are ways of doing experimental validation that maybe don't show-show completely, but give you an indication that narrow the set of variants, that seems to be okay. Or, or we're proposing that that would be okay. What just be careful with the uh, language you're using. The experimental validation that shows a variant causes the disease. The association is just a probability that's associated with the disease. Absolutely. I can't believe that you'd have an experimental validation that would prove it was causative. Uh, you would, might prove that it changed the expression of that gene or something else, but the idea that you could make a direct correlation to disease. Um, is not that simple. Oh, absolutely. And so that's the that's the that's exactly gets to Jill's question that at the highest levels these are associations. Then when one is doing doing something else experimentally, there certainly are cases where um, the pathway has has been worked on. So you start with associations, you narrow down a set of variants, you then do experimental work, clinical work, and you you think or you more or less prove that that variant causes the phenotypic effect. It's not based on just a whole bunch of associations. So absolutely, we're trying to move beyond GWAS associations. Um, we're trying to get to that middle ground where it's more than just associations, and yet it's not one variant, one huge research project. You know, because we want to eventually be able to use these methods to at least narrow down the set of variants that then can have experimental studies can be studied in much more detail. Does that help? I think the, I think the phrase experimental validation was also left intentionally open um, in hopes and part of stimulating uh, good ideas in that area. And as written, it could go as far as what you described as the gold-plated experiment where... Um, Do you mean gold standard experiment or gold-plated? Gold well, standard. if it's a mouse, gold it's gold-plated as well. But, <laughs> no, I'm just... The, the, that, that's the problem with the true recreation where you generate... You know, this was recently published, for example, for the coding region variant in the EDAR gene, one of the areas that shows strong signature of selection in uh, Asian populations. The specific human amino acid variant that shows one of the strong associations was recreated in the mouse, an expensive experiment, because uh, it was a knock-in that at the very same residue in the endogenous gene made the switch, and they uh, verified a whole series of animal phenotypes that were generated by that single amino acid change. Now that's a very expensive um, whole animal experiment. You're not going to be able to do very many of them if you try to do that for all of the interesting things that have come from GWAS, and there may be a variety of situations where you could have uh, cell culture models of phenotypes um, that, that are in vitro surrogates of things that you would like to be able to score in a whole animal. 
Um, so there's a range of possibilities that I think vary in how expensive they are per variant, how whole animal-like they are, and how surrogately they are, and all of those uh, could be put together or proposed by investigators in what uh, will then be looked at to see what's the most compelling combination of prediction and some sort of experimental test of whether the, the predictions are finding things that have functional effects. Please, sir. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to ask, this is a really important point because right. I think the, the, this could be the poster child for what Jim said and David reiterated about the loop of trying to connect back to the biology of, of, the, of the disease through, I mean, back to domains one and, one and two. Um, but it depends on what percentage of the effort goes into that. Some of it may be very high throughput, but there might be good reason to do a significant number of those, and significant is the question related mm -hmm. to the budget, of those gold-plated, gold standard, where it's warranted. So do, have you, is there a, in the concept clearance, I didn't see a kind of a ratio of effort on the computational versus the validation. Uh, yes, well, we initially had suggested one, but the small uh, group of council members we'd initially consulted about this said, don't put in a specific limit. It really depends on the expense of the method. And so that, so there's no limit there. I mean, what you're talking about, in a sense, is validating the validation method, that if you have some um, gold standard methods that, that can validate that you're <laughs> um, bronze standard methods actually work well, then that becomes you have sort of a few very expensive assays that will validate a larger number of less well, expensive. They may not be so expensive, you know, it was mentioned by Eric, Cas9, mm -hmm. CRISPR technology, mm -hmm. you may be able to do very rapidly create mm -hmm. mice that have, you know, both alleles replaced and, you know, Rudy Anish had a beautiful paper just demonstrating that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. If that sort of proposal came that in as an innovative way to be able to test function, I think that would do great in this sort of RFA. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think what, what you want to get across, right, is that you want the community to kind of hit the sweet spot, that you, you can't set the bar so high, um, but, mm -hmm. but talking about experimental support or uh, orthogonal types of, of mm -hmm. support or validation seems to me to be what will provide the most, most uh, um, coherent message. The, the other thing I would just throw in there is um, I'm, I'm very much in support of looking at the non-coding regions if for no other reason than the fact that so many important things seem mm -hmm. to land in there. Um, but I, I, I think it's very important to remember that we still are clueless as far as interpreting most variants in the coding regions, too. Yeah, so, the causality issue yeah, I mean, associated is, is completely true for coding as well as yeah, non-coding. We have the you know, genetic code, and that's a help for it's a minority a help. of changes, but it right. by no means gets us out of the woods. So I, Absolutely. I, just, I don't want you know, people thinking that NHGRI thinks that we've solved that problem, and now we're on to the next one. Absolutely. And actually, we say somewhere in here. Okay. <laughs> Focus on non-coding variants for the reasons we discussed. But, I mean, if some method gets you a region and there's some coding variants in the, there, that's fine. And many of the techniques will, will work Be agnostic. regardless of that's whether right. they're encoding or not. And that's, yeah. that's completely so you fine. Wanna, you don't want people to forget that as they write these and think about them. That's right. So what we're not looking for are sort of improvements to, fig to ways of inferring because of a non-synonymous change. And functional, right, right. You know, a non-synonymous mm -hmm. change, you know, affects protein structure this yeah, way yeah, yeah, and yeah. therefore it's more likely to be causal or something right. like that. So that's a real focus on coding variants. But as you said, you know, there are certainly methods that are agnostic to codingness or not, yeah. and those are completely acceptable. Do you want to? Yeah, to, to follow up on what Jim's saying, one thing we would like is if people are going to follow up protein coding variants, that they should do it in an agnostic way. Some of the more interesting examples of non-coding variants were found because they were initially coding variants, and upon further study, it turned out they were tag SNPs for a nearby non-coding variant. Okay, so which variants potentially affect organismal function? Um, sometimes this will show how the effect is brought about, 
or the genetic architecture if you have things like gene-gene or gene-environment interaction. So we expect applications will include the computational approaches um, as well as the experimental validation of these approaches. We're not looking for large-scale production of functional data aside from the validation data. And we're not looking for things simply like databases or just aggregation of information on variants. Um, there's a lot of data sets that are available to use. Um, so the initiative focus is on genome-wide interpretation rather than somebody saying, I have a very interesting region and I really want to study the variants in those region, in that region. What we're looking for is approaches that can be applied to a lot of data sets so that you start with the entire genome, such as GWAS. GWAS starts with the entire genome based on association, comes down to particular regions, but it's not saying I just want to a priori look at a particular region. It doesn't have to be GWAS. Something like genome scans can also start with the whole genome and find regions. So I would su suggest, I'm wondering if you could add to this concept clearance the idea of having a coordinating center whose job it will be to run a contest where you would provide variants uh, to groups that say they've developed a method and then have them all analyze those variants and see how they do. Sort of sim similar to what Brenner does with KG. Yeah, I was just thinking of KG. No, that's yeah, that's exactly. interesting. Uh, let let me get to one more. But then, but then, don't uh, you need a gold standard to judge them? Yeah. Yeah. You would you would have you, you would have to develop you 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 would ask the coordinating center to uh, try to develop such a gold standard, but it would have to be something that's not in the public domain so that they couldn't cheat. <laughs> exactly. Um, that's quite a, that's an interesting idea. Um, it's, it's quite related to this. Um, I'll also point out the focus, even though we want them to focus, start with the whole genome and go down, different classes of variants may have different properties so that CNVs, say, or transcription factor binding sites or CPG islands, the, the, the signals of which variants are actually contributing to the organismal phenotype may differ according to the class of variant. So, um, so we're not trying to say you have to. Again, this is very hard and it's kind of early days, so we're not saying, here's a genome, give me all functional variants. So Lisa, yeah. uh, would you say that kind of the driving idea behind this is to sort of flesh out, you know, the best computational methods that are out there, somebody who might be saying, well, I've got this theory that knowing something about the network structure would really help me predict which enhancements which will be really important. And so I'm going to make some predictions, and then I think I can test that using this cellular phenotype, and I'll read it out and see. And so I, I viewed it as that way, right? Sort of saying, okay, and, and then once, and you, you would want to fund sort of a portfolio of maybe a couple of network approaches, maybe somebody who says, what I really think is important is to take all the ENCODE data and put it through some prediction algorithm that's actually totally um, agnostic. It uses machine learning or something to make predictions. And then I'll run that through and see how well that does. Well, I mean, no, but you, you know, you, so you, could, you, you could imagine that a series of different approaches will be put forth, and then by, you know, having all these folks liaise with one another, you'd get some best practices, and maybe they'd be even sharing some of their gold data standards, for example. I, I don't know, but it seems to me that, that that was sort of the, or did I get that wrong? Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good description. Um, and the, of course, the reviewers would like to see some evidence that a method being proposed can actually work, and I'll, I'll get to that issue towards the end. We also figure that these, these people, these groups will be meeting like once a year exactly to exchange ideas and possibly uh, validation data sets and ap approaches. Okay, and we want the methods to uh, generalize beyond the specific data sets and diseases studied. So basically the idea is that you start with the whole genome and go through a series of approaches, and this is just a kind of a very straightforward, simple-minded um, example where you have the whole genome, you do GWAS, you come down to regions, then you look at, say, transcription and cell types related to the disease and it gets you down to certain ones and then you use ENCODE and regulation and pathway and other data sets to get to a smaller set of variants. Um, other examples are things like, um, you know, instead of starting with GWAS, you can start with a genome scan of natural selection. Um, chromatin, you know, there's an example where chromatin structure, you have an indel that, that affects what's the open um, chromatin structure there, and so and we already know examples uh, where that, where those indels actually change, 
change um, the chromatin structure and therefore affect whether uh, like um, persistence of fetal hemoglobin or phthalacemias. Uh, so there are examples like that, you know, a very simple minded thing is promoter binding. Um, knowing which variants actually affect the promoter can help you interpret the variants. Epigenomic variability, so the variability itself gives you a clue as to importance. So there's, there's a set of types of things and, and we certainly hope the applicants will be quite imaginative and come up with good, good methods for the computational approach. For the validation methods. Um, you know, there's a range of types of validation as we discussed. They can use model organism data. Uh, the concept clearance says that we're, we, we encourage innovation in methods for validation. I mean, what Joe Acker was saying about CRISPR methods or those sorts of zinc finger, you know, very specific things, maybe very nice validation and maybe not too expensive, that would be terrific. Okay, there are um, some other initiatives. Um, NIGMS had an RFA that was related to figuring out everything you can about function of variants, um, both experimental and computational, and they included things like databases. So they made about eight awards or so, only one or two of which are kind of related to this at all. So they haven't solved the problem. Um, other institutes, uh, in, including ours, are doing very somewhat developing some data sets, experimental data sets. Um, for very, you know, functional methods, but that are experimental. So those will be good data sets to use. Uh, so the timeline we're talking about, we're talking about two rounds here, and we actually think this is quite important. Um, it's sort of partly getting at Carlos's point. Um, so receipt dates in January 14 and January 20 and January 2015. So if a receipt date, so anybody who's kind of ready to go can put in an application. But because this is difficult, because there's a lot of moving parts here, that they have to have the computational approaches, they have to have the experimental approaches. It'd be really nice if they had some preliminary data showing that their computational approaches actually work a bit. Um, by having a second receipt date a year later, we give some confidence for groups to actually put the work to, to pull together the experimental and the computational side. And so we think having two rounds kind of defined ahead of time will actually help stimulate the field. It will actually put together collaborations. Those groups will have a chance to get some preliminary data and put in good applications. Um, because of the experimental side especially, we think these are, are reasonably large grants um, that we really want to especially, again, this is a very difficult topic. Um, we really want to have the validation in there, so it's not just association based. Um, so we figure a uh, 500K direct cost per year, make about five to six in each round. Okay, so actually, we're hoping we'll be able to start interpreting the non coding part of the genome. So, any other comments? Uh, Mike, did you want to say anything more? Um, any other comments on this? Ross. Yeah. That, uh, first of all, I th thank you for this uh, very thorough and, and, and clear presentation. And uh, uh, I'm very excited about this uh, concept clearance. It's clearly a high priority area. It is clearly one that really <laughs> generates a lot of excitement. And you can, I mean, just it, it, the, the council couldn't let you finish your presentation. They had to keep jumping in. And, and, and Carlos even started designing the proposal <laughs> right there. I mean, it's, 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 it's that good. It is so important. It's very, really exciting. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're, uh, well, I, I, I really encourage moving this forward to, to an RFA as, uh, you know, the way that you've got it. Uh, set up. Um, some of the, this issue about, so it's the experimental tests are vitally important and, and they're going to be part of it. I, I, I hope you can come up with a, a shorter title that will still uh, convey <laughs> that. <laughs> but using the term validation is tricky. Yeah. And it does have specific meanings and, uh, to, to a lot of people. I mean, to, to me it means that, that you're going to uh, take a, a, a conclusion that you've inferred from one set of data or, or, or one technology and you're going to test it with an orthogonal technology. That's really validation. Mm -hmm. And given, and this is back to Anthony's point, given that the initial idea is that these something in a region is 
associated with and potentially causative of a disease, then validation has a very high mark there. Mm -hmm. But there's, uh, there are other ways to define this. I, you can get a lot of mileage out of just experimental tests. I mean, it, it's, it's a broader term. And, 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 or support. And the idea is to, yeah, okay, yeah. That's, but I like that sounds good, it be all, It's not all computational. That's what it is. It's great yeah. that it's computational because it has to be genome-wide. And, and let me also emphasize something that you, you did point out. Well, for, we, we can see the epigenetic signals giving us strong information. But there are lots of them. There's actually many, many variables to bring in. Now, that's another thing I'm very excited about because nobody knows how best to do this. We all kind of have a, a little intuition about how, how to go about it, and, and many people are already active in it. But we don't really know what the, what the best way is. It, have, it has to be computational. It has to go genome-wide. But computation in the absence of experimental feedback Mm -hmm. it is, is of limited use. So I think this is, uh, uh, this could really work well. Um, I also like the fact that you, this is set up, I think it's set up to not over-engineer, not over-design the RFA. <laughs> and, and to do, I, I think, was it, Carlos, you said, let the best of the, uh, um, of the community, the community's best ideas. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, re really uh, uh, come to bear. So I think it's great. I, I also really like the two rounds, two rounds of, because not everybody's uh, uh, ready for right, prime right. time on this, mm -hmm. but there's so much excitement. Give people a chance, give many people a chance to try. We just wish there was more money to put into it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. on, on that, I, I agree with that. And I'd be even content with plausibility. <laughs> You know, biologic plausibility is something. I mean, no, even. even well, no, but I mean, that's how far off we are. So, so just I mean, some form of words that make it clear yes. that we don't need to. We we want to be um, towards an understanding. Right. The um, actual RFA, of course, can have a discussion of this. So, so take your point that validation may be too strong, plausibility may be too weak, support might be in the middle, but there will be a discussion of it. So hopefully people will kind of understand what we're going for. Any other comments, discussion? So if there are no other comments, uh, we take a vote on concept clearance matters. Can we just have this friendly amendment about support versus validation? Oh, yeah, sure. Would you like to, would one of you like to state the amendment so that we have clarity? Oh, just to change the title from experimental validation to experimental support. So Yes. We can go with that. All right. Mm -hmm. So can I? Um, Motion to accept. Thank you. And a second. <laughs> All in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. <laughs> OK, thank you. Good, good discussion. <laughs>